Hello, welcome. Welcome to a packed house at the Knowledge Centre here at the, at the British Library. Um, it's wonderful to see you all. I'm Roly Keating. I'm Chief Executive here at the BL. And it is great to see you all here for this joint British Library Eccles Centre and Fulbright Commission special evening uh, in celebration of 75 years of the Fulbright Commission. We're going to be hearing a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. Um, and uh, lots of colleagues and friends and supporters in the room tonight, but if I may, a very particular welcome to this year's 2023 cohort of Fulbright Scholars, um, for whom I think you can consider this part of your induction to the UK. We do this kind of thing every night. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's just what happens here. So um, this 2023 has been a bit of a year of anniversaries, because in addition to Fulbright, uh, it's also the 50th anniversary of the British Library, uh, a younger institution than some people think. And that we're cheating a bit because, of course, we inherited amazing collections from many other institutions, including our friends, of course, at the British Museum Library. Um, and it's also been for us a year of a little bit of looking back, but as ever, for a library looking forward. And we launched uh, a little bit earlier in the spring our new strategy called Knowledge Matters, setting our course through to the end of this decade and relevant to our conversation tonight, quite an assertive uh, statement of principle there in the title. And do take a look at it. It's, it, it's online. But you'll notice in there one of the themes under our international purpose, where we talk about working with partners around the world to advance knowledge and mutual understanding, uh, is a particular renewed focus on collaborations and conversations and activity with the Americas. Uh, so this is an extremely meaningful both relationship and moment for us. And that tradition of working on uh, our American partnerships and relationships uh, is underpinned, of course, by the work of the Eccles Center. Founded in 1991 through the vision of uh, David Eccles, the um, British Library Chair uh, back in the 1970s, uh, and his wife Mary Hyde Eccles, um, it was set up to ensure that the best possible value was created and creative, intellectual, scholarly value was created out of the really remarkable American collections that we hold here. I'm sure many of you know one of perhaps the most significant collections of material about not just the USA, but the whole of the Americas, North and South, uh, available outside the continent. And there was a, a vision not just of doing great work with the collections, but also bringing people together uh, across the Atlantic. And therefore, of course, the Fulbright Commission has been a central key partner ever since the beginnings uh, of the Eccles Center as well as shared events uh, like this. The Centre funds uh, a Fulbright Scholar each year uh, to uh, research in the British Library's collections. All kinds of topics, all human life is here, uh, and that's the task of those researchers. And that work that we do together is underpinned by shared values. Uh, the value of cross-cultural exchange, uh, a commitment to fostering excellence in scholarship and research, and most importantly, and you can see it happening tonight, a deep belief in the importance of participation and public access and public benefit. In Knowledge Matters, we talk about something we describe as a historic disruption uh, in the global information system. Uh, and we talk about the role, perhaps, that libraries and the traditions of libraries can play in that disruption and maybe sometimes as a counterforce to those disruptions. So tonight's event and discussion could not be more timely or more important and we are thrilled to have the guests and panel here tonight. Um, so I'm going to uh, do only two other things on this platform before uh, handing over. My first one is the housekeeping message, um, which is to say that if you hear an alarm with an interesting two-tone warble, that is not a rehearsal, that actually is a fire alarm. So please do make your way, uh, leaving difficult belongings and things behind you to either of the shown exits. Don't use the lifts and gather in the piazza below. 
Second bit of housekeeping, and Mukul, you therefore don't have to say this, is could you please um, keep your mobile phones switched off during this, uh, during this event? And then my other remaining pleasure is to introduce, to say a few words before we hand to the panel, to uh, uh, the executive director of the US-UK Fulbright Commission, our friend and partner, Maria Balinska. Maria, please. Thank you, Roly, for your warm welcome and for the British Library's support over these many years. We are so proud to be your partner and to be able to play a part in advancing the British Library's mission of making your intellectual heritage accessible to everyone for research, inspiration, and entertainment. Oh, sorry, enjoyment. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, um, and by the way, that is not only through our wonderful Fulbright Eccles scholars coming here, um, it's also because our very own commission archives are housed at the British Library. Today is an important occasion for us, um, not just because it's the first time we've had this event since COVID, um, and not just because, as Rowley referenced, it's the first day of orientation for our 45 American Fulbright postgraduate students and mid-career scholars who are about to begin their UK adventures. What makes this particular month really special is that it was exactly 75 years ago that the US and UK governments signed a treaty to establish the US-UK Fulbright Commission. In September 1948, the general mood in the UK, only three years after the end of the Second World War, was by all accounts pretty gloomy. There was, for example, still strict food rationing. But this plan, this plan to send people in both directions across the Atlantic to study and immerse themselves in another culture was a hopeful one. It was about building understanding and empathy and peace. So much has changed, of course, in the last 75 years, not least, the 45 Americans came over by plane, not by boat, as they did in the 1940s. But the essence of what the Fulbright Commission aspires to remains the same, and very much as urgent as it was in 1948. Our vision continues to be of a world in which there are no obstacles to learning, to understanding, and to collaboration. And while, of course, education exchange programs are the primary means in which we look to achieve this, we also see the Fulbright Commission's role as that of a convener, a meeting place for the important and sometimes difficult discussions that need to be taking place about the pressing issues that face us as a planet. We know these aren't easy conversations, and they shouldn't be, because the challenges are complex and the perspectives on them are going to differ. But that is exactly why we feel bringing international and diverse viewpoints and experiences to do address them is so very critical. The spread of disinformation, tonight's issue, is a threat to our health, to our democratic systems, and to our planet. How we deal with this threat as individuals, as governments, as professions, as communities, is vital to our shared future. It's particularly appropriate to be having this discussion at a library, a linchpin in the information ecosystem, and still, according to public surveys, one of the institutions most trusted by the public. In a minute, you're going to be introduced to our distinguished panel, but first, I want to introduce you to the equally distinguished chair of our discussion, who is both a Fulbright alumnus, went to Columbia Journalism School, and very fortunate for us at the commission, is one of our trustees on our board. Mokul Devachand is the editor of audio programming for the New York Times, a new role at the frontier of digital audio based in New York City. Previously, Moko was at the BBC in London, where after many years and many awards in international and in investigative reporting, he became known as an editor for pioneering new programs and new initiatives in the intersection between broadcasting, 
and digital media. His last role gives you a flavor of this. His title was the first executive editor of Voice and Artificial Intelligence, taking, as he puts it, the values of public broadcasting into the new space of IA assistance. You could not be in better hands for this discussion. Mukul, over to you. Can't ask for a better intro than that. Okay, everybody, 2020, next year is 2024, and we expect to see over 50 elections across the globe. And in every single one of those elections, the spread of disinformation, the spread of falsehoods online will be a real anxiety. And so this is a conversation that really matters for democracy. And it's one in which the Fulbright Commission, which has a global mission of exchange and convening minds, is well placed to play a role. So first of all, I want to thank you all for being here. We're going to have about 35 to 40 minutes of discussion with our panelists. And then we'll be taking your questions, including from those joining us via the live stream. And so, we're actually quite a few years on from when we first heard this term, right? Disinformation, by which we mean our social media and our online communication being gamed, being manipulated by political actors, sometimes even foreign states, it's a pretty known problem. Uh, I'm, I'm myself an editor, but you yourselves as readers or listeners to journalism, you'll be familiar with these tales of partisan political actors trying to influence elections or sometimes trying to do other things, more worrying goals, using digital subterfuge. And tonight is not about retelling the many, many misinformation stories, including some which have left deep scars here in the UK and in the US and elsewhere. Instead, tonight, what I want to do is draw out the constituent parts of our global information ecosystem, the tech, the regulation, uh, and more. Let's get into the details. Let's ask what's truly broken with the internet, what's vulnerable, and where we can look for solutions. And I really couldn't be in better company to do so. We have a pioneering investigative journalist, a tech and media scholar with influence on these debates, and a leading policy advisor on digital integrity for election bodies globally. So more specifically, let me introduce your panel. Carol Cadwallader is the Observer and Guardian journalist who, along with Times Report, along in the New York Times as well, broke the story in 2018 of the 50 million Facebook profiles that were harvested for Cambridge Analytica in a major data breach to target US voters in the 2016 election. For this groundbreaking work and more, Carol is a Pulitzer Prize finalist and a winner of the Orwell Prize for Journalism. Jory Craig is a resident senior fellow at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, where her work focuses on safeguarding democracy and the wider impact of online harms on society. Uh, of direct relevance to this discussion, Jory's worked on initiatives to counter disinformation in the 2020 US elections and the 2019 European Parliament elections. You might have heard Jory when she testified in Congress on this topic. And in keeping with our transatlantic theme, she's an American based in the UK. And joining us from the US, from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, is Ethan Zuckerman, Associate Professor of Public Policy, Communications and Information, who has researched misinformation and the internet and society at some pretty box office institutions, at MIT, at Columbia, at Harvard, uh, but he also himself founded and ran a variety of tech for good platforms, including the international citizen media platform, Global Voices. And Ethan doesn't necessarily know this, but when I was running units at the BBC, we kept a competitive eye on what he was reporting because he wasn't just uh, studying misinformation, he was really revealing instances of it. Ethan is also a Fulbrighter. He spent his exchange year at the University of Ghana. And I'm told he wrote the code for the first pop-up ad. So, <laughs> high achiever. <laughs> so please welcome our panel. Okay, so guys, let, let's start with this, right? This information is not new anymore. Uh, we're not in 2016. All three of you here have been revealing how bad actors do this for years now. So has all of that had any impact? Uh, Carol, can we start with you? 
you know, you're one of the preeminent reporters working on this. Are you a bit more optimistic now that society can better handle disinformation? I mean, I think it's very interesting, Phil, that you draw attention to 2016, because I think the, the whole point is about the, the sort of series of elections, uh, disruptions which happened in that year, Brexit here, Trump in America, um, Duterte in the Philippines, just to three examples. We really didn't know what was happening at the time. We weren't really paying attention and we weren't aware of the way that the platforms could be used in this way by political parties to spread lies completely unaccountably in total darkness. And, you know, it has been a multi-year effort by journalists and academics and law enforcement agencies to better understand that. But, I mean, I think you have to go back to 2016 because, uh, as I said, it was this, you know, grand effort to unmask that. And so much work has been done. And yet, um, you know, nobody was actually held to account for any of the things that we saw during that pivotal year. There's been, in the US, and certainly no meaningful legislation there has been no safeguards put in place, frankly, for global elections. And, you know, we are now seven years on. We have now got this most disruptive technology probably the world has ever seen, has just been unleashed upon us. And we are accelerating towards, as you say, a set of global elections in which this is going to be you know, used in ways we can't even imagine yet. And I find that a frankly terrifying prospect um, because the, the, I think we will look back and see what, what happened in 2016 was just very basic compared to what is now going to be possible, which is, you know, the creation of disinformation at scale for zero cost, um, which can be highly personalised, and, you know, the thing we know about elections is that they, 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 they accelerate these kinds of technologies because it's a singular outcome, it's a zero-sum game, you have really committed people, you have tons of money, and you've got the ability to just throw things at the wall and see what works and what doesn't. So I, I personally think we're in for a very terrifying period of history. Sorry, not very optimistic. Well, look... <laughs> Uh, as someone who, you know, we, we publish stories about misinformation all the time, I understand why you're worried. That said, if I can, you know, if, if I can try and put the optimism... Mean, and by the way, we are going to come back to this question of generative AI, which you, which you referenced, I think. But if I can try and put the kind of optimist view... I mean, after your reporting, Facebook had to pay a very large fine. Well, well can we just talk about that really yeah. briefly? Because I always point that out. So Facebook paid the biggest fine in uh, US, the financial, the, the FTC's history. It paid a $5 billion fine for what happened, this massive data breach. And, and on the was same... Was it five, $500,000? Well, no, in the, in the US, it oh, was the $5 billion Facebook got right. fined. In the UK, it was £500,000. Right. pounds. The SEC also fined it $100 million. That was announced on the same day. And on that day, you know what happened? Facebook's share price went up. Because that is literally the worst that the toughest agency in the United States, where it is based, could do. And $5 billion is pocket change to a company like that. And nobody, as I said, none of the executives were held to account. Nothing had to actually change. And, and here we are now. Right. So it's, it's kind of that that's where this no. re regulation of the tech platforms today has not worked. I hear you. And of course, you're there talking about the UK and the US. And we, we also know that the same issues are playing out in many countries across the world. And we'll come back to that. But Ethan, can I turn to you? And maybe if you could, if I can ask you to bring in that kind of academics view and lens because I know you've been studying that, what lessons can history teach us about how to cope? Um, and do you share that pessimism when, when coming from the US, the home of big tech, you know, will we be any better this election cycle? So I want to go a little bit further back in history, if I might, and I'm going to do so by introducing you my latest hobby. Um, I have lately been um, 
picking up newspapers uh, from the late 18th century. Uh, so immediately after American independence and sort of trying to get a sense for what the news and political climate was like in this country. And so I'm holding here the general advertiser of uh, February 27, 1795. Um, and I'll tell you, reading these papers, um, they're not filled with a lot of what we would call journalism. Um, for the most part, they are advertising. There's a certain amount of uh, reporting in the sense of here was the decision made in the Senate on that day. But for the most part, what it actually is, is political propaganda. And it's the sort of thing that we would be very cautious about in a newspaper today. But of course, keep in mind that journalism as we know it wasn't really invented until, you know, roughly 100 years ago when we started getting significant investigation. So why am I talking about folks like Samuel Adams who sort of manufactured what the Brits know as the incident on King Street and turned it into the Boston Massacre? Uh, many of the US patriots at this period of time were incredibly skilled political propagandists publishing what we would now call mis or disinformation and we didn't really have a robust press that was trying to debunk this. We really had a space that was incredibly disruptive, much as the internet was incredibly disruptive. So the reason I think this is so interesting is that you still managed in the United States in the late 1700s to come up with a functioning democracy. And when you try to solve that problem of how did we go from fairly weak press filled with mis and disinformation to robust public dialogue, what you have to realize is it's not just about the information. It's something about the institutions that surround it. What the states was really blessed with at that moment was a really participatory political culture, a lot of organizations that were meeting together every week to talk about information, talk about the news, work out questions of public opinion. We're now encountering mis and disinformation at a very, very different moment in time we're coming off a long period during which journalism was quite reliable and where you could rely on what you're seeing in the newspaper and on broadcast as being carefully researched and in many cases having edges of agenda sort of rubbed off of it. So we're going through this profound learning period. People had to figure out how to read this stuff and how to put it into context. And frankly, it took hundreds of years for them to get there we are now radically accelerating that process. And perhaps the part of that process that we have to think the most about is figuring out what ends up on these platforms and how. What was so important about Carol's work and sort of other work going on there is that it shows us that it's possible to have mis and disinformation that operates in entirely different ways than we're used to. We are used to on some basic level people believing crazy things and putting their ideas forward. What we are not used to is people constructing thousands of personae to make it look like what they believe is believed by a large number of people. And so we need to start learning how we read and interpret at this moment in time. It is not so much mis and disinformation that is toxic, it is our inexperience with reading and understanding this media system which is evolving so very quickly. And let's talk a bit this evening about the path from here to there. Um, jury, I mean, this is part of your work, you know, about sort of how do we adjust the global information ecology. Um, so I want, to, I want to ask you a bit about how we go about that. But before I do that, I want to ask you one specific thing, um, and I am sorry for using a four-letter word, but someone was going to use it tonight, Musk. And <laughs> Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter. Now, that is an interesting big change in the information ecology. Um, a, a platform that's seen changes, some are calling it a collapse. How should we read these events within the bigger misinformation saga, you know, specifically that, and then, we'll, and then we'll go more broad. Okay. Well, thank you for letting me be the one to take this. <laughs> uh, 
Um, hello to my fellow Americans. Uh, as an American living in London for a short period of time, I welcome you and let you know that there are no blow dryers in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> that's something to get used to. To the point about tech CEOs, and it's funny, as Ethan and Carol were talking, I was sitting here thinking, how can I talk about global tech CEOs having tantrums without being specific? Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to be general, but I want to go to your original question about what makes me hopeful or not. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Carol. Most of my days start and end being rather frustrated with the landscape. Um, but where I do see hope is in particular in people, specific groups of people, often young people, who are advancing things, and the swath of people who, in my sector, researchers, journalists like Clarell, who have disrupted things enough to the point where you do see um, CEOs of major tech companies um, taking pretty brash action um, and disrupting things on their platforms, making really um, bold statements. Um, and I think that does show that there is an impact and things are being shaken up, um, and that's positive. That said, the shift in the landscape around Twitter in particular has been um, not ideal for public discourse, for research. It's been harder for researchers to access the data. Um, it already wasn't perfect, especially on the part of the other platforms, which have a larger majority of people on them anyway. Um, and then I like to offer that though Twitter is kind of falling apart from what it used to be, and many people, often people who spend time in circles like this, are upset about that, I offer that actually the over-reliance on Twitter data and the fact that what in public opinion research we call opinion elite spent so much time disproportionately on Twitter looking at their peer groups on Twitter, seeking the approval of their peers on Twitter, and being disconnected from where other <coughs> online conversations were happening and not really seeking those out, especially because they couldn't source their reporting that way, it wasn't easy, it wasn't accessible. I actually think this moment where Twitter is no longer going to have that same pace of feeling like everything's going on and everything's there because it's becoming a more unpleasant place to spend time could potentially open us up to seeking information, sourcing information, listening to parts of the public on and offline in ways we should have been the whole time. Um, so that usually isn't a perspective that gets shared because so many people have such a um, real loyalty to spending time on that platform, but it, it does present an opportunity. Um, and in the meantime, I do hope that it at least causes um, policymakers and regulators to look at the, the safeguards they do indeed need to put in place because there are too few with disproportionate power over what goes on on these platforms. And um, I, I'm going to come back to that. I, I could talk about Elon Musk all night, and I won't. Let's not. But, <laughs> but I can't resist going to Ethan and Carol for a quick comment. I mean. You know, I will offer that one of the things about Twitter is that it had what's called an open API, right? Like you can actually study what's happening on Twitter in a way which you can't necessarily on other social platforms. It's a little bit more open. You know, I, I'm interested in what, what, you know, we don't know what will happen exactly with Twitter, but I'm interested in your quick takes, perhaps Ethan and Carol, on, 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 on the kind of potential demise of Twitter or, or the way that Elon Musk is taking it. So it's not just Elon, it's a broader shift in the landscape of how we study social media. Um, Elon in many ways fired the first shot. He took um, a tool that almost all of us use to research uh, the open API and he started charging uh, $42,000 a month for it. Uh, by the way, that's, that's a joke, by the way. He wanted it to reflect the number 420, which is uh, California code for possession of marijuana. It's his way of showing that he's cool. But by charging <laughs> researchers like me more than half a million dollars a year to study Twitter, the answer is that we don't study Twitter anymore. He then responded to what many of us were doing, which is we were scraping Twitter. We were writing our own tools to pull data off of the Twitter website. Uh, and he started blocking those and in fact requiring everybody to log in to see the website literally as a way to keep the platform from being studied. Reddit has now followed in his path uh, and is making it much, much harder uh, to study. Facebook has taken down uh, some tools that were very, very helpful. CrowdTangle uh, was a tool that was extremely useful in studying the last two US presidential elections. It's been disabled somewhat. The message I have been trying to get out to people is that uh, if you thought 2016 was bad, uh, wait for 2024. We've actually lost most of the tools we had 
to do at scale quantitative study of what was happening on these platforms, we're running into 2024 without tools and we're also getting sued, right? Because this is something else that Elon is now exploring is the idea of taking people to court for defamation when they publish research about his platform that he doesn't like. It's an incredibly scary moment to study this field. Thank you. I, I don't think you're going to add a note of optimism on that, <laughs> Carol, but are you? I am, actually, oh, because okay? my, my point is, is that I think we, we've been banging on about how these companies, these platforms on which the entire world runs its political and public discourse should not be in the hands of a few crazed billionaires. And I think Elon has just demonstrated that so brilliantly now that we can now understand the consequences of that. And that is why, in terms of solutions, it's like we ha it has to be about structure and ownership and um, uh, yeah, for, for me anyway. And so thank you, Elon. So <laughs> <laughs> and Jory, that's really interesting because that pertains to something that you said to me before. You know, in a way, I think, uh, and uh, as a journalist, I deal in stories, but in some ways, these stories are so, are so juicy, each one of these stories, but maybe it distracts us from actually solving this problem. Mm. I would say that the way we came into speaking about the problem of disinformation and experiencing it, because what we had available to us were tools to look at the content appearing on platforms, has put us into a space where the majority of the conversation is happening around this dichotomy between types of content that are true and types of content that are false, and then all this content in the middle, which is the majority of content. Um, and I think that there are massive power structures that want to keep us in this dichotomy. They want us to be having a conversation about free speech and censorship, and why? One, in part, there is no free speech environment on any of these platforms. It's a curated speech environment, and none of us are in a position to be having freedom over what we're necessarily seeing appear in our feeds, but we never talk about that. And people enjoy the um, prize of being champions of free speech when actually they're kind of kings of censorship in some cases. Um, also, because if we're talking about speech and censorship and free speech, we're not talking about the systems, the profit models, the way these companies are making decisions, the lack of standards they have, the lack of safety standards they have when they have to make those decisions. I mean, unlike any other industry, they enjoyed darling status for a really long time and didn't have to really put any safeguards in place that any other major industry has. And so, so long as we're talking about which meme is more truthy, we're not talking about any of that. Mm -hmm. um, and it does, unfortunately, um, center the journalism industry, which is such an important part of this conversation, and they hold the pen. Um, and it's an important part, but not the only part. But because it is, it affects them, and they're holding the pen, and they're the ones researching, and they're the ones needing to source their material, which you do so by checking content, um, we kind of stay in this frame. And it means that when we're trying to evidence conversations that are leading to regulation, um, we're mostly left with instances of content and speech and narratives. And I think that just gets us away from progressing forward. I'm not saying it's not important to explore the way content is affecting public discourse. I'm just saying that it is a part and perhaps a much smaller part of the conversation than it's been. Okay, so, so let's stick then with that kind of bigger cultural canvas, right? Um, you know, let's talk about how we get to some of what you're talking about and the impact of so much disinformation on society on the way that we even frame these questions. Uh, and maybe we can start by talking about what is maybe the most important social glue we have, which is trust. Um, Carol, you and I both come at this as journalists. Um, as a reporter that goes out in the field, what does the, the kind of lack of a source for shared facts do to society? You know, what has it ma meant for you as a reporter covering this stuff? You know, w w what is the big cultural effect of all of this on the way we, we live? I mean, I think, it's, I think it's really profound, isn't it? And I think we, we all have seen and experienced this, which is that we're all living in separate realities now because we're getting our news and information from separate sources and they don't overlap often. And, and actually, is it, possible, is it possible to have a functioning society when you don't have shared agreement of basic facts? And 
I think the kind of the answer is is that it doesn't really look like it, and we've seen this repeatedly. You know, we've seen mm. it um, in a, everything now is a culture war. Everything becomes gr uh, grist for the culture war mill, um, and I think that is profound and fundamental. And um, and I think it's it's you know it's it is kind of touching to have this conversation in the British Library, and to hear Rowley talk um, about you know the role of the library as this institution, this guardian of facts and evidence and literature and knowledge, and and I love that idea of it's a bastion against this, but I think that we're in these really really stormy waters when members of one family can't agree on shared facts around particular subjects. I think that is really problematic. Mm. And, 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 you know, talking about institutions, libraries, the, the mainstream media, what, you know, I mean, I'm myself a little cautious about even saying this, but what do you, what do you make of this kind of mea culpa, you know, were, you know, that is, this is what people are saying, that we were too elitist, we were asleep at the wheel, we were not aware of what's happening, even before this information came on the scene. Do you think there's been a failure of institutions for disinformation? I mean, I think there is, I think that, I think that it's, it's, I think the sort of perceived elitism is something perhaps, I was, I was saying to Mukul, I was saying there's a, a lot of people have a lot of reasons to kind of like hate on the New York Times. And, and the, when Trump started doing it, he, you could see it kind of got this groundswell of report, didn't, uh, of support. And then he sort of, you know, he then used this idea of disinformation of fake news against the institutions themselves. And it, that was why it was such a sort of bizarre moment, I think, in 2016, wasn't it, when that was reversed? Um, I don't know. What, what, I mean, I, I think, I mean, the, one of the things we're saying is that I think one of the things now is that actually, if that is the case, it's because we haven't realised that our power has gone mm -hmm. in that the, what we think of as the mainstream media, which is things like the BBC and The Guardian and The New York Times, are no longer the mainstream media. This isn't the place where the majority of people are getting their news and information. People are getting their news and information now from the social media platforms. That is the mainstream media. We are fringe... Uh, media, maybe that makes us elitist in that we're hanging on to things like facts and evidence-based <laughs> reporting and science and, you know, old-fashioned things like that. But I guess, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I, I don't really see a way of that not being elitist in the way. Yeah, I hope we're not the fringe, but um, Ethan, help us then. You know, um, there is this cultural anxiety, there's this, this distrust of authorities, of institutions, there's this notion of authenticity and genuineness. Um, and as, as Carol says, those who are trying to bring facts to bear, the journalists and the fact checkers and others are somehow labeled as not authentic. Um, you know, how to respond? How should we Look, respond? We're, 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 we're being quite ahistorical in this conversation. Um, and, and we're treating this as something that's really brand new and sort of connected to the technology associated with it. And I tried to make the point previously that going back hundreds of years, you can find these moments where people are selecting their own facts, they're selecting their own point of view, and they're navigating their way through it. But let's look at trust very specifically. My last book was called Mistrust, and I did a big deep dive into trust in institutions. And in the United States, trust in institutions goes through a massive slide in the 1970s. So quite a long while ago uh, at this point. And it's largely a slide that has to do with institutions failing. There's economic crisis, uh, there's oil shocks, and, and people end up reacting to those institutions by saying, we don't think you're fit for task, we don't think you're doing a very good job of this anymore. Um, we've seen other institutions sort of lose trust over time. The main thing that happens when you lose trust in an institution is you sort of navigate around it. You sort of say, can I solve my problem some other way? Um, and you have doubt about anything that that institution is putting forward. 
So yes, absolutely. We've got real doubt, uh, not only organic, but also being weaponized. We found people who found a way to essentially say, we know you don't trust institutions. The media is the ultimate institution. Don't trust a word they have to say. That's a weaponization of things. The way that weaponization works is that doubt leads to paralysis. So if you can put someone in a situation where they don't really believe anything anymore, they don't trust anyone to be able to sort of carry anything out to give them the truth, the response in many cases is just stasis. I'm not going to do anything of any sort. In some ways, I think what we need to do is think really seriously about what are these patterns by which people are finding information and finding ways to take action in society. Yes, I would love it if more of them were routed in the reality that I find myself in, which is largely The Guardian, The New York Times, the BBC, so on and so forth. But I think understanding that at the end of the day, people want to feel like they can have an effect on the world. People want to feel like they can address the problems that they are trying to make a change on. I think if we look very critically at what media has done well or poorly over the last 20 or 30 years, I think in many cases we have left people feeling deeply disempowered and deeply unable to make an impact on the societies in which they live. Okay, so Jory, you know, give us a hand. We're the mainstream media then, you know, what's your advice? How do we position in the new in a in a restructured digital ecology? You know, do we do more digital platforms? Are we out there correcting disinformation, verifying what is the role? And also, what are the sort of structural changes beyond us, beyond the media, that, that get us towards this, you know, correct this particular via in history towards misinformation and disinformation? I would start by asking who's in the room? Who's in the room where we're having this conversation? Who's at the table? Where are they from? What do they represent? And how are they feeling about their current information consumption? a term that a colleague of mine at the Center for Humane Tech used, how are they feeling about community sense making? Community sense making, I loved that frame when he um, suggested it. Uh, you know, you talked about a participatory democracy that the US had um, when, the time, when our papers were basically all propaganda. Um, there were more spaces for us to make sense of things together. And I think that we've seen the collapse of those in a bunch of different ways. We have a loneliness epidemic in the U US. Um, people are feeling not so great coming out of a pandemic. So even though that conversation might seem different from the one you just asked me about, should we do more podcasts or should we have influencers retweet our stuff, it's actually really related. So I'd be asking who's in the room, and then I'd be trying to frame that conversation more as if no one knows anything. I mean, one really unique part of 2016 was it was the first time that there was this big, well, not the first time, certainly not, first time in my lifetime, that there was a really big moment where a lot of the people who were the experts who were publicly on the record all the time were all together on the record and wrong at once. And it opened this moment for people to be brought to the table who were not previously at the table because people needed them to understand what was going on. And I think we should have recreated that moment over and over and over and over <laughs> until things felt better. I also think we need to look at how we're measuring whether things are better. Um, and I think that, you know, is it who, how many people are consuming the most truthful reporting? I'm not sure, how about it's people, you know, do people believe in factual reporting? I think a lot of the people who believe in disinformation or believe in conspiracies, they believe in factual reporting and they feel they're consuming it really strongly. So is it teaching people that, you know, our way of consuming the facts or our way of reporting on the facts is better? I don't know, is it spending more time with them? But I know that we have to start making sense of things together as a community more often, more frequently in a more representative way and that will get us to a better place. Um, for me, I have a lot more hope when I focus on local institutions, local media, local community groups, um, looking at representation at that level. The New York Times, other mainstream media, that's a bigger thing to tackle. Um, certainly diversifying where content is going and thinking about the time horizon as, you know, and on Twitter thing, things move really fast and I remind people that on Facebook, where still, even though it doesn't feel like it, the majority of people in the US are spending time. Um, and on Instagram and on TikTok, the time horizon for a piece of news is way longer than it is on Twitter. It's news for a week or two weeks, maybe longer. 
And all the movement, you know, Twitter, it can be over in 24 hours. It can trend and then be done and we're on to the next thing. Well, meanwhile, everyone else is community sense making while the folks who are only consuming long form articles feel like they're onto a new story of the day. So maybe we could spend some time looking at that, looking at where people are actually spending time online. Um, but other than that, you know, I think I just trust Ethan and Carol to solve the rest, so. <laughs> well, uh, and, and also our audience, who I hope you're um, submitting your questions. So just a few more minutes of conversation and then we'll go to your questions. Um, you know, Ethan, we spoke about this before. It is about all of these things. It is about creating a more civically minded internet. But it, maybe it's also just about the law and giving the law teeth. And, you know, it strikes me that actually we have had a bunch of laws, right? We've had in the EU, there's not just GDPR, but there's the Digital Information Act. There are laws around news and <laughs> platforms in Canada, in Australia. The US is maybe unusual in, in the Western world in terms of not having an information commissioner. So sketch it out for us, you know, there's been quite a bit of chat and some laws. Are we better regulated as a world now than some years ago? So let's talk about how effective those laws have actually been. Um, I spent a good chunk of the summer in Canada. One of the major debates that's going on there is the fact that there is now law on the books that requires <coughs> um, Facebook and others to pay news publishers for their content. Uh, as a result, Facebook no longer permits the posting of news content. Um, from Facebook's point of view, it's about 3% of their total revenue uh, and maybe 95% of their problems. So it's very easy for them to sort of cut it off. But then you have the city of Yellowknife being surrounded by wildfires and no one can actually um, share information coming from the CBC or other reputable sources about it. That was certainly not the intention of the legislation, but it was also a foreseeable consequence. Facebook did exactly the same thing in Australia. I think a lot of times the laws are extremely well intended, um, but the fact that all they can really do is penalize certain behavior, put a cost on certain behavior. Uh, in the US, it's very, very hard to sort of say, you're going to publish this, you're not going to publish this uh, due to the First Amendment. We are seeing laws that I think for the most part are fairly reprehensible uh, in the US. They are trying to ban state-owned devices from using TikTok. They're trying to ban uh, people under 18 from accessing certain services. Um, there are two court cases that are trying to make the case that Facebook and others can't filter content because they're concerned about it having an anti-Republican bias. The US at least doesn't have a particularly good track record of putting legislation on the books. If we did want to put legislation on the books, probably the place to act is transparency. And there is an act that has been trying to get support called the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act. It would at least take on some of the questions that I mentioned before. How do we study what Twitter's doing? How do we study what Facebook's doing without having the data to know what these impacts actually are? But what we have right now is this odd circumstance where we're sort of shooting and then taking aim. We don't actually know what the specific problems are in many cases because we don't have the data to be able to accurately identify what's happening. We are legislating at popular topics, but not necessarily the right ways of going at it. Whereas if we could simply put some real time into getting transparency on these platforms, figure out where the problems are, we might be in much, much better shape as far as crafting legislation. Right, and then in the middle of all of this, as you say, the law hasn't maybe quite caught up. We have, as Carol was saying at the beginning, generative AI, a whole new set of technologies, powerful technologies, and the EU is talking about regulating AI and the ownership of data, but it's not there yet. And these, I think every malign actor has already got their hand, played around with, with you know, uh, and good actor has, has played around with some of these tools already. So, I mean, do you agree, Ethan, with what Carol said? Do you think the impact of generative AI kind of just makes everything worse again? I, the way that I try to think about generative AI is to think about, uh, 
uh, Prigozhin's earlier act, uh, before he was uh, running the Wagner Group, he was running uh, the IRA in St. Petersburg, which was a building filled with English speakers who were creating fake content to post all over social media. Uh, and that was expensive and difficult to do. They had to hire a lot of smart people in Russia to be able to do it. Uh, now all you really have to do is run ChatGPT. Um, the truth is we're going to see a great deal more generated content. What most of us aren't seeing is that platforms actually have three ways of trying to fight the content that gets put on them. They tend to refer to this as the ABCs. It's actor, behavior, and content. Actor means if I see someone posting to you know, 10,000 different identities at the same time, I know that they're a bad actor. I know that they're a spammer. And when I see them next time, I can say, this is a spammer. I want to bring their content down. The second is behavior. If I see someone creating controversy over and over and over again, I can conclude that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to sow dissent. They're trying to do bad behavior. Maybe I go ahead and block them. C is the hardest. It's the content. You look at a piece of content and you try to say, maybe this is inauthentic. Maybe this is machine generated. It's really hard for people to do. Platforms are actually really good at blocking behavior based on actors and behavior. They're very bad at it based on content. We, as consumers, really only get to see the content. We can't see what IP addresses people are coming from, so on and so forth. I have a lot of hope that there are people at Facebook and TikTok and YouTube looking very carefully at actor and behavior to try to block this content. I know for a fact that there are not those people at Twitter because Elon fired them all. <laughs> so I'm very worried about Twitter because they've lost that sort of ability to protect themselves against that. The responsible platforms, I think in many cases, are going to have the actor and behavior strategies to be able to counter some of what's worst about generative AI. And okay, and final word before we go to the audience, Carol, just, um, you know, go on. Uh, sorry, I, I was gonna ask you a question, but you, you have you something go. to say, go on. What well, you, we, well, say it, say it. <laughs> There's so much to say. Just, I think the thing that you were saying, Ethan, there, it just put me in mind of, the, do you remember the um, Christchurch massacre, which was live streamed by the gunman on Facebook? And then I don't remember, I don't know if you remember that day, but every single platform was flooded with that video. And they couldn't, they, 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 what they said was, they said that they were taking down millions of copies of that video per minute. They said that they were getting down 95% of it. But they, that left 5%, which was flooding every platform, which millions upon millions of people saw. And that was, you know, that was a very clever technological um, thing, which, uh, you know, which was, uh, I believe, AI generated, which was that they were changing. So all of these platforms have filters. So if it's a copycat of a video, they can take it down. But if it's slightly digitally altered, it escapes that filter and they can't get it down. And that was what was happening. It was flooding every platform. And so I think that was one single incident of a particularly extreme violent event. But you can imagine other scenarios where that happens. Where um, and, it, and it was interesting because there was a researcher who told me that they believed that that was a... That, that, that was actually a trial run by a hostile nation state which were using that as a practice event. That was, I'm not sure how, what their evidence was, but they were sure. hypothesizing that. So I just kind of think events like that, which is where you've got the technology to be able to do that. I think you can understand where in another circumstance, what that could look like. Right, I, I, absolutely. And you know, BBC Trending reported on something similar, sort of AI generated um, TikTok videos, spreading cr some very violent imagery just recently. But, okay, for the 5% left over, you know, is there a way that sort of literacy about these things, telling the story to a wider group of people can be a bit of an inoculation? So when you see stuff, you understand this is maybe not real, you maybe question it. 
I think the thing about it is we're, we're, we're talking as if this, this disinformation is we kind of there, we, we all see it, it's, we're all exposed to it, but that's not what happens. And even in 2016, that was the case. It was people were targeted. So it wasn't you or I who were receiving these fake, these adverts, these, this fake news, which looked like news articles. It was really, it were, you know, specifically targeted demographics who were exposed to the absolute fire hose of it. And, you know, the point that I always bring up in Britain, because it still infuriates me, is that we, we weren't able to... We had no access to that information because it was on the platform and then it disappeared. And the thing about elections in the UK is that every pamphlet has to have an imprint on it of who's, who's paying for this, and all of them are housed and archived in the British Library, and I think it's six other recording libraries. And yet, we did not have those. Uh, we had, it, they were on Facebook servers, and then they disappeared. And the British government demanded them from Facebook, and it refused to hand them over. And I think that's really fundamental, because that is a, a massive change in the way that we do elections. And I think it shows that the power of these companies compared to the power of the nation states and where that balance of power is. And, um, and I think thinking about what, you know, again, th this idea that we can hold on to this information, whereas we, we, that's not possible in this digital age. Things are there and then they're gone. And so I think in terms of thinking about libraries in this ecosystem, it's a really important sort of thing to think about. I'm sure people will ask about it. So let's go to the audience with your questions. Uh, the usual caveats, please tell us who you are. Maybe no long biographical notes, uh, but really interested to know what you would like to ask our panelists. Um, so we have a question down here. Um, I'll take two at a time. So one down here and one over in the top right-hand corner there. Yeah. Thank you all. That was uh, fantastic and also very scary. I'm, uh, I'm Chief Librarian. I'm going to ask what do you think the role of libraries could or should be in countering disinformation? Okay, so let's have a think about that and quickly take the other question too. Um, I'm Connor Herbert. I'm a full writer. Um, and I'm going to Durham University. Um, maybe I'm a nihilist in this respect, but recently, I, I live in the Midwest, and I've had conversations with people who tell me, you know, oh, corporate, or like media in our, you know, in our country is owned by corporations, maybe you have to go to the internet to get our information, and then they'll oftentimes rattle off uh, websites that you can quickly fact check on Wikipedia as spouting like right-wing news and not real information. Um, I feel like there's not much you can do about institutions without looking at the people that are consuming them. And it, like, how do you talk about literacy as like a fundamental aspect of like getting to the real core of the issue when those people that are illiterate in engaging with our media are unwilling to engage with these core institutions that are, you know, formally understood as like the poor. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, Ethan, I'm going to, uh, I think probably all three of the panelists could answer these questions as a wrap-up in a sense, because they're both getting at the same thing. You know, what, how, how can we help people to trust and engage with institutions like libraries? How, what role can that play in, in what we've sketched out tonight? Ethan, why don't we start with you? So it's, um, it, it would be a great moment to get the librarians um, even more engaged than they are, although the librarians that I know are, are some of the busiest people in the world, and I'm reluctant to put uh, more on them. I do think this question of getting past the ephemerality of all of this is critically important, as Carol suggested. Um, my preferred intervention in this space is that I think we need to know a lot more about what's happening on these platforms. I think we need access to the information so that we can study them and figure out patterns over time. And I think we could really use the help of librarians in recognizing that these conversations happening on these various different platforms are over time shaping history. Um, so being able to archive them, being able to study them, having access to them in ways that are privacy respecting, but allow us to actually understand them is critically important. I will say to Connor's question, one of the things that's happened in the last 20 years as we tried to teach people about media literacy 
is we made some very bad errors. The first error we made was we told people, don't believe Wikipedia, do your own research. And do your own research has now turned into sort of a rallying cry for the paranoid. Uh, and what do your own research means is search on Google and keep scrolling until you find something that you agree with. And that's not a particularly good way to research. This is another place where the librarians, I think, could come in very handy. I think Google and others are sort of realizing that pure algorithmic search is being gamed all the time. People are trying to figure out where to go with it. That's why they're hoping to replace it with artificial intelligence. I'd love to replace it with librarians. I would love to see a situation in which we're going onto Google and we're searching for something complex and controversial. And what we're getting is a page that's actually been put together by librarians trying to figure out how to synthesize and understand the different points of view that are going on there. Again, I don't think we're going to take some of the busiest people in the world and get them to rebuild internet search. Um, but if you gave me a large sum of money, that's probably a project uh, that I would invest very heavily in. And Jory, I know you have thoughts about this. I mean, we in the New York Times, unfortunately, you know, have had to run stories about how little trust there is in librarians and other institutions out in the country some, sometimes. How, to, to Connor's point, how do, we, how, do, how do we regain some of this trust? Sure. I love the question, Connor. I'm also from the Midwest. Uh, I think the Midwest is a great place to think about um, a lot of these trends. Um, one, one thing that's interesting is, you know, when, when you take, I'm a public opinion researcher, so when we write a survey and we ask people, do you trust librarians, we're asking them, do you trust librarians, not do you trust Miss Smith who lives next door, who you know, whose daughter went to your school, et cetera. And I think that's a really important part, getting back to the community sense making. I think that's also a really important part of the question around what should the conversation around literacy look like? I think already from a starting point of you know, coming in and saying we're gonna teach you how to read information and consume information is kind of the wrong starting point. Does anybody feel like it's easy to keep up with information right now? I mean, does, do any of us feel like the current information environment, even though it's being delivered to our hand, is making us feel safe and secure in our knowledge about what's going on in the world? I personally don't. I just read a book recently about how we've really traded depth for speed in our culture. I would love to sit down and have an intergenerational conversation in a community about this feeling that everyone's probably having, starting from a place where we're all on the same page, instead of having me come in and say, I know something you don't know. Also, I do think there's a critically important role of young people and just people who get to digital adaptation trends faster than others. It's been the case the whole time. Um, and it was largely a lot of young people who helped explain what was going on when the term disinformation became a term we started talking about as if it was new. Um, not just young people, but also people who are in parts, other parts of the world, aside from the most heard from Western democracies, um, involving them in that conversation again. Um, and in terms of librarians, I would say um, libraries and librarians need to be funded which means uh, we need to be having a conversation about participation in democracy in general, why it's important, how it affects our day-to-day -day lives. Um, instead of talking about, you know, on the sort of uh, academic or philosophical level, level about why democracy is important, I, in the Midwest, just like to remind people that democracy is responsible for the long wait time at the DMV, which is where you get your driver's license. That's a better point to start at when I try to convince them to engage and pay attention to what's going on in the election and, and actually vote. And I think from there, we can remind people and make people feel like the li library is something that represents them and is a place for them to be empowered to fight the man or to fight the powers that be. I mean, it's no secret that all of us have corporate interests coming for us. I mean, they're selling me shoes I love every day. Um, you know, I mean, it's not a secret. No one's better than it. It's happening to all of us. So while all of us might not have the same um, you know, vulnerability to certain toxic narratives or extreme rhetoric, we are all living in the same information environment that's a little bit difficult and new for everybody. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Carol, what do you think? Should, should I just really briefly, I, I'm really fascinated by the library's question and because maybe the Americans in the audience don't know that in Britain, and you're going to have to step in here for me, but is it correct that two copies of every book published in Britain are lodged in the British Library and the Bodleian, and is it, there's four, six in total, right? Public libraries in the UK, uh, the National Library of Scotland, Wales, uh, the British Library, uh, Oxford and Cambridge, and Trinity College, Dublin. Yeah. And that's, and how long has that been going on? Since 1970. Since 1970. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So, and it, so, so that's why it's this amazing resource that we have, you know, we have deliberately set out to capture this national archive. And I'm really fascinated by the attempts now being done because we don't live in a textual world anymore. And what is being published on the internet is not being captured. Well, it is to a degree. How much you do it? I mean, it's kind of fascinating. Dot UK, right. We do a crawl of the dot UK domain. Right, right, right. We have, and we have a digital legal deposit for stuff that's published. But yeah, in terms of the web, we can only crawl the, the dot UK. Which is amazing. And But then there's also, of course, the entire what's happening on social media. And I, I mean, it's just for, for me, I, I kind of think that, that librarians have got to get militants. The fact is, is <laughs> as I say, you're entitled to those political advertising and you didn't get it. Right, and and this that you're entitled to what is being published here in Britain to a British audience, and you're not getting it. I think that, frankly, you need to unionise. You need to get to the valley. You need to like. Okay. Get, you need to take the fight. Well, so anyhow, that's my. Um... The, the, this is where it began. But no, um, um, it, well, look, it goes back to Ethan's original point. You know, in some ways, there are no new challenges in the world, um, and some of the things that got us through in other eras might might help us now. Um, let's take another round of questions. Um, so I will take one from the, from the gentleman at the back and one um, from the lady at the front with the green. Uh, thank you. I'm here. I'm originally a Belgian Fulbright, but I was also at Columbia, so perhaps not at the same time as you. Um, I'll keep my question very pragmatic. I'm building on something that Ethan said in the beginning of the, of the uh, conversation here. Um, if you look at just the UK, you used to know what people, or you made sense of news knowing who, whose agenda was writing which newspaper. So you had the Guardian on the left-ish, you had the Times in the middle and some other people on the right. What's the new constellation now? So how do we now make sense, just practically, right? If our kids ask us a question, who do we tell them to believe? And, and with what agenda behind it? Okay, thank you. And we have a question down the front. The lady in green is going to supply a question. I believe, from the interwebs. Hello, I'm Polly from the Eccles Centre, and I have a question here um, from an online um, viewer, uh, Dr Shah, and he said he's a researcher and he's concerned about how to tell students where to find the truth. He says, Denzel Washington said something interesting in an interview that the media's responsibility to, is to publish the truth, not to publish first. Is part of the problem the paradigm about publishing first rather than pro publishing the truth? Well, I'm going to say yes immediately to Dr. Shah. <laughs> but, um, but no, why, why don't we take both of those questions? You know, um, advice about the spectrum um, and advice, uh, you know, about, um, about how, how to teach, you know, uh, people about news. So, Carol, why don't, why don't you set us off? Uh, I mean, I'm just going to go very briefly on that one, which is that there's a sort of, there's, a, there's an expression which you may have heard, which is the journalist's job is not to say, well, on the one side... Some people over here say that it's raining, and on the other side, some people over here say it's not raining. The journalist's job is to look out the window and say, mm, is it actually raining? And I think that we have failed to, to a large degree in this, and we've seen this particularly in the climate debate, for example, where this two-siding goes on. We've seen it in the coverage of politics, and it took a long time for the US media, I think, to call out Trump uh, a, a lie as a, a falsehood is a falsehood. Um, so I think we have to be, journalism needs to be more robust and, um, and that's going to help, I think, in terms of engendering trust. I'm not sure if that was an answer to any question, but anyway. <laughs> well, no, but it's uh, sort of to both and, and neither. Um, Ethan. So I'm, I'm very sceptical of, as uh, Jay Reslin likes to put it, the view from nowhere. Um, this was really seen as sort of a, an ideal, at least in American journalism, for quite some time. And depending on the journalist that you're talking to, many of them will still uh, defend it quite fiercely, this idea that um, I don't have an agenda, I'm simply trying to, to tell you what it is. Um, simply deciding to focus on one issue rather than another is a form of agenda. 
uh, right now, the New York Times in the States is spending an enormous amount of time talking about climate. Uh, I think that's right. I think it's worthwhile, uh, but it certainly reflects an agenda of one fashion or another. And I think what's going to happen is that we're going to get better at this, uh, at understanding that whether it's a newspaper, whether it's a random individual on the internet, they have certain patterns that they are coming from. They have certain patterns of uh, what they're looking at and what they're not looking at. I think to answer the question about truth, I think speed is a, a critical piece of this. Um, we get very used to this notion that the truth might be someone witnessing something on Twitter and then telling us about it immediately. And what we've now found in retrospect is that, you know, speed kills and that the faster we are, the more likely we are to get something wrong and report breakouts of Ebola from uh, Burning Man in, in the Las Vegas desert uh, to give maybe the most recent example of this. It takes real time to navigate between those different points of view, those different perspectives, and try to triangulate our way towards truth. And I think getting better at being a little uncertain about what happened until we have some time to let a bunch of people report on something and try to figure out what consensus reality looks like, I think that's something that we're all going to have to learn how to do a little bit better. Jory, um, I'm interested in your view, and perhaps particularly to the first question, you know, in a world where opinion travels, you know, very fast, um, how does one begin to decode it? How, how do you begin to understand what's left, right, up, down? Mm -hmm. Well, Ethan makes a point that um, my colleagues and I make a lot about transparency. So I'll reiterate Ethan's point about transparency needing, I think, to be the baseline catch up we do on legislation. Like we can't understand an agenda if it's just so, so easy to hide it. And it's still really easy for bad actors to hide their identity. Maybe the platforms can see what's going on, but none of us can, and the platforms don't always have an incentive to tell us about it. Um, in terms of the movement of opinion, I am interested in what Ethan said. I mean, this is something I hadn't thought of until Carol, and then Ethan responding to Carol just brought it up. But right, like, you know, I think the idea that there's any possible um, approach to journalism that's completely neutral is maybe a non-starter and gets us to a place where already it's just too difficult for to be believable, and so the starting point is that we're lying, right? Like, if we're starting from a point of being neutral, yet we are humans behind the pen, um, maybe that starts from a place of inauthenticity. I don't know. It's something I've just thought of now that, they, now that um, they've both spoken about that. Um, in terms of the question about young people and talking to them about the need to check news, um, I would um, ask them, I mean, I do a lot of workshops that are, I guess, literacy workshops. I don't really frame them that way. But I would, I would think about it, the starting place being asking them how they get to the bottom of something online. I mean, young people are digital sleuths. And if they want to know what's going on, mm -hmm. they will figure it out. And perhaps um, we can all learn something from the different practices of different demographics and then collectively, again, decide how we're going to choose to source things. I also think giving examples of what happens when you don't source. So um, I like to talk about my own consumption of misinformation. I did share a piece of information during COVID, which was about dolphins swimming in the canal, which is super embarrassing. And if I start with that, you know, oh, maybe- Oh, is this the, the wildlife at all? Yeah, all, it was a National yeah. Geographic fit. It was not good. But at least it gave me this, you know, humility moment where I could yeah. bring that to conversation. It may not be the worst thing that anyone's- well, thank you. Thank you, Muckle. Thank you for that. Um, um, but I think, it, I yeah. think it is good to just start with a point of, again, kind of coming to the conclusion together with the students, even though that's not the traditional role between, mm -hmm. between teachers and students in every setting. Um, but for this instance, you might build trust with each other. They might build trust in sources. There's yeah. also the thing that you just want some things to be true, like Ebola at Burning Man. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> I was that, right that, behind that, that is, that, so, <laughs> That, that is true, and as Ethan said... You, you can said, root not, you for know, it, it just doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> you know, not all journalism has always been good in all the time. <laughs> However, um, what you said about not even really knowing who's behind it is, you know, it makes all of this very, very difficult. Um, now, do we have time for any more? Or we, I think we may be coming towards the, the end. I'm looking. We don't. Maybe one more. One last question. Who's going to supply that? Um, let's go uh, right to the back, because... Um... Uh-oh. It's like <laughs> throwing a ball and... Yeah. Want 
Thanks very much. Um, I'm Fran Panetta um, from the University of Arts London, um, director of the AKO Storytelling Institute. And um, we've just set up our own fellowship program where 13 uh, fellows started this week thinking about how storytelling can best counter disinformation. And actually, we've been talking about this all day today. And I'm really interested in what you three think about this. You talked a lot about journalism particularly, but we have people from arts and documentary and design and sound and academia. So kind of more broadly, journalism, yes, but more broadly, how should um, our fellows be thinking about um, how storytelling can be um, kind of helping to combat disinformation? It's a great question. And I, I, looked, over your, uh, I looked over your materials earlier today really exciting uh, workshop. Let's go to that then, storytelling. I mean, I'll take it if you first. I mean, I think it's, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great question because really, in so many ways, I don't think journalism works anymore. Journalism doesn't work in the way that we think it works. We think that you publish the facts, you publish the truth, and then, you know, people are going to be outraged and it creates change and governments fall, et cetera, you know, water gates. We're all waiting... That just doesn't work anymore. We don't live in that kind of information space. And I, I always think when a key thing I read um, several years ago was it was an interview with Adam Curtis, who's a documentary maker who does weird and wonderful documentaries. And he wrote about how that he thought journalism failed in the financial crisis. It was a real example of how there was endless news reports but there was no story. And so that's how the bankers got away with it. And that's why we are still paying for that now. Um, and I, I sort of, that, that, that sort of, it was, it's been, it was a real touchstone for me in thinking when I was trying to do the Cambridge Analytica story, which was very complex. And it was, a, it was like, it's no good just doing news stories which have got these facts because it doesn't add up to anything. You need a story. That's how we are as humans, as people. So I think it's absolutely vital. And I think that emotional connection to story, which first had us as humans sort of grouped around the campfire, is the thing which does give me a little, yeah. tiny, teeny, tiny bit of hope. Sure. And I'd like to hope that as journalism, we are doing <laughs> some good storytelling as well as the facts. But uh, Jory. Yep. So I think it's urgent. I put a lot of my eggs in that basket. If someone were to tell me what could you do now urgently, I would say invest in the arts and make it part of this conversation. Um, a few reasons why. One, just learning about the way our brains process information. We like a beginning, middle, end. And so in the absence of providing an end to whether it's a disinformation story or whether it's just the story of division or cohesion in society right now, um, others will fill in the gaps or tell us what that should look like. And so I think there's a need for stories where we envision what a better situation looks like. I also think that I routinely see people who study this problem, I include myself, People who study this problem, talk about this problem, think about this problem, observing it and talking about it as if they are not part of it. And I think, you know, and stories have the power to make, to put you in the story, to, to tell the story of how you are engaging, whoever you may be in, whatever your role may be. And I would love to see a multitude of stories that show a diverse set of roles and a diverse cast in how we sort this problem in this story. Um, because I think right now there's still too many people, and I have a lot of examples I'm happy to talk about outside about count, you know where people in the sector who are regarded as experts have fallen into these really basic traps that are set out by this information ecosystem, almost as if they thought they never were vulnerable to it and they could just watch from, I, I'd say, the ivory tower, but that would be too cliche. Um, so I think, you know, yeah. all in on that. Great. And Ethan, final word. I just finished reading a very good book by uh, Jeff Goodell called The Heat Will Kill You First. And it's about global warming and, and heat related illness. And it could have been a dreadful book, uh, but he has one trick that he uses over and over and over again. He shows you the story of someone dying from exposure to heat and then trying to explain why there are thousands or millions of people in that category. The good news about that is that that's something that journalists have learned over the years works. We latch onto stories. And if you do storytelling responsibly and essentially say, 
this is a story, it represents hundreds of thousands of stories. That's incredible work. One of the things that is so dangerous about this moment in time is that because we are so wired to stories that if I stand up and tell you an absurd story detached from reality, you have a tendency to sort of say, well, I'm sure he represents hundreds or thousands of millions of people. And you process it in the same way that you process these very intelligently put together stories. We're going to need to think really hard about how that personal storytelling works for good and works for ill, because we as humans are incredibly vulnerable to stories. And I mean vulnerable in both the positive and negative way of, of using the term. Can I add one more thing? I th Certainly. I'm going to, thank you. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say, I think the arts play a huge role in how we tackle AI. And, and we use AI to empower us to solve this problem instead of just experiencing it and letting us harm it. I think they're already at the forefront of that. So I'd encourage your fellows and your storytellers to be thinking about the role of generative AI in their storytelling. Great. Amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. OK. Well, look, that is it. Um, I would like to say a big thank you to the British Library and the Fulbright Commission for allowing us the space to have this important conversation. And please join me in thanking our panel, Ethan Zuckerman, Jory Craig, and Carol Cadwallader. So I um, get to have the last word um, uh, asked to by my fellow, my colleague from the British Library. And on behalf of the British Library and the Fulbright Commission, I want to thank you, Mukul, for leading us through such an illuminating, a thought-provoking, and if I dare say this, studded with facts um, conversation. Um, despite the enormity and the danger of this moment and of this problem, I, I'm not gonna leave this room feeling despondent. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that the four of you, as well as many people in this room, are still involved and in working in our information ecosystem. So thanks, thanks again to all four of you and to everybody here. <laughs>